So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk to you about an administrative topic. Um, we're all aware of the 30-day readmissions penalties Medicare has, has had. I'll talk about the impacts of practice variability, and I'll talk specifically about some heart failure decision rules that can help us make less variable and arguably better decisions. I do have a conflict to reveal. My wife and I co-own some shares of Johnson & Johnson stock. I've worked scrupulously to avoid that having it influence my comments. I also have received honoraria for being the scientific chair for a number of other, number of other congresses that are put on by AAM or related to AAM. And so I'm going to get right to the point. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to frame my discussion about heart failure because heart failure is the most common of the diagnoses that Medicare penalties can be accrued for. And heart failure is an increasingly common disease. It's important to us because of it's, it's, it's so common. It's a situation where we could make better decisions and it's important to policymakers because we spend so much money treating heart failure. And why do we spend so much money treating heart failure? Well, America's not getting any younger and America's not getting any slimmer and we have more hypertension and obesity. We have more patients surviving their first MI, and so we have more and more patients with heart failure than we have ever, have ever had before in the United States. And right now, about 7.5 million Americans are living having had a myocardial infarction, so they're inherently at risk of heart failure. And we can improve the care of heart failure by decreasing interphysician inter variability of decision making, as I will illustrate. And the decisions about whether to admit patients who, admit, who arrive to ER with heart failure, of course, begin in the ED. So I'm going to teach you a way to use your resources a little bit more efficiently and still maintain patient safety with two heart failure decision rules. Again, getting back to heart failure and why it's important, it's the number one reason for hospitalization of people over age 65 in the United States, and it causes over a million emergency department visits per year, about 80% of which result in admission. And I will teach you a decision rule that shows that that 80% is higher than it has to be. And by 15 years from now, it's estimated that we'll be spending $70 billion for heart failure care in the United States. That's about $200 per citizen. That's roughly the incremental cost added by smoking for, per citizen, which is about $1,500 per smoker per year. So it's a big issue. And heart failure is about 3% of all current U.S. health care expenditures. It's, the, like I said, the number one reason hospitalization of the elderly occurs. And therefore, looking at heart failure and waking, making making its care more efficient is, an, is a logical target for third-party payers like Medicare, like private insurance companies. And so we're seeing the scrutiny of heart failure care, including readmissions, because it's such a common problem. And heart failure, as you probably know, is one of the, one of the conditions for which Medicare penalties to the hospital can accrue if the hospital has what are deemed to be excess readmissions. So in 2012, this program of Medicare penalties was initiated, and the first three diagnoses were acute. MI, heart failure, and pneumonia, and later on COPD and orthopedic procedures of total hip and knee replacement were added, and pretty soon cardiac bypass will be the next disease entity added. And the penalties accrue from Medicare perspective during rolling three-year periods that um, um, can begin on July 1 of a given year and end on June 30, three years later. So for fiscal year 2017, the rolling three-year period was July 1st of 13 through June 30th of 16. And fiscal year 2017 began October 1 of 16. So, what, which, so, so these pen, Medicare penalties, who gets penalized? It's hospitals that are deemed to have excess readmissions within 30 days of hospital discharge for the six conditions I've discussed, the five now, six to be when cardiac bypass is added. And then there's a risk adjustment more, more methodology that it's used to adjust the hospital's risk for readmission based on its patient's uh, characteristics. But arguably, this risk adjustment model doesn't accurately capture the risks of uh, the, the uh, left ventricular assist device programs. So LVAD hospitals are, ex are extremely at risk for Medicare penalties under the current uh, paradigm. And all, remember, all 30-day readmissions count. So if someone goes home with heart failure as their diagnosis and they're readmitted because a hip fracture two weeks later, that's counted as a heart failure readmission. And that doesn't seem fair, but the reason that's done is to decrease coding, gaming of coding when someone comes back in the hospital. If someone came back in the hospital with a heart failure re-exacerbation that really was heart failure, and they got admitted for shortness of air, and that was their diagnosis, that might be an attempt to slip one by the regulators. But the regulation is so broad that it actually goes the other way.
So more about the penalties. Um, some people believe Medicare is going to, uh, Medicare's lead will be followed by commercial insurers, and Medicare clearly is looking toward uh, shutting the door on the 23-hour the 23-hour visits where they're not a full-fledged admission. And in future iterations of this rule, we will not only be penalized if we have quote unquote excess readmissions, but also quote unquote excess 23-hour observation stays for these patients with the target diseases. And um, the, the thing that's so important and why it's an important issue now is by taking action now, you can decrease your hospital's risk of penalties later. And by doing that, you can become your administrator's best friend. Because if you can figure out a way to make your hospital less susceptible to Medicare penalties by, inc by implementing changes in the emergency department in terms of how you handle the patients with these, with these diseases of interest, then you can help the hospital avoid uh, revenue deficit that they may not be able to avoid if not for your action. And um, for most pa patients, for most hospitals, the heart failure readmission rate needs to drop under 20% or less. And so in my slides, I will not take time to talk about the exact methods for talking about calculating the penalties today. But I've left some references for you to look at if you wish to go back and look at my slides later. And they're just for your reference. I'm not going to spend time today in the interest of uh, your time and an interest of your interest to get into the weeds on how the Medicare penalties are calculated. And so it's complex, there's numerous steps, but at the end of the day, um, the readjustment factor is always something less than one. So it's, a zero, it's not a zero-sum game where some hospitals gain and some hospitals lose. It's actually, will your hospital lose nothing or will your hospital lose something or will your hospital lose a lot? And there's not some other hospital down the street that's going to be profiting from your being penalized. And here's a, a graph that shows the hospital at which I was practicing before I moved to St. Louis, the hospital system actually, and it, it's heart failure readmissions rate. And the keys to point out, and, and it doesn't show up very well from the back, so I apologize for not making it larger, is that, that one hospital's readmission rate is on the order of um, 18% and, and the, the ranking percentile wise, it is such that you can make a huge change of percentile ranking if you make a small change in your readmission rate. So even re changing your readmission rate by one or two percent over a three year period can drop your percentile rank 10 or 15 or 20 percentiles. And that's why it's so important to be attentive to detail on every patient is because by making a difference for a few patients you can make a lot of difference in your percentile rank and you can move your hospital system or your hospital well away from the Medicare penalty zone. And again, uh, it's not just about admissions, the observation status window is going to close eventually. So you might view heart failure readmissions as a cardiologist problem and maybe, due to, maybe they failed to educate their patients well before they went home and maybe the, the patients are non-compliant or what have you. And you may see, think that in the emergency department you don't have much influence over heart failure readmissions rate, but I'm going to challenge that assumption. And, and the, I can challenge that assumption with data from the hospital system at which I previously practiced. And we found out that our heart failure dispositions were not uniform. And when there's lack of uniformity of physician practice, there's often an opportunity for improvement in patient care. And so um, in our hospital system, we found a large degree of variability in, in readmissions for heart failure in the same group of pa doctors who treated 30 or more heart failure patients over a two-year period. And again, if we can decrease readmissions, we can help move our hospitals out of the penalty zone, and we can help become our administrator's best friend. So can we make a difference in the ED? Yes, we can. Again, it's by decreasing interphysician practice variability. And when our, in our hospital system, we found out that for 2013 and 14, we were admitting 87% of patients with heart failure and take, keeping another 6% in observation status. We were only seven, sending 7% 7 of patients home who were admitted for not new onset heart failure, but exacerbations of heart failure. And this graph shows the tremendous physician variability in practice patterns. The, the most extreme non-admitter admitted only 66% of the patients they saw with heart failure exacerbations. At the other extreme, some physicians admitted 100%, and our median was about 87% of admissions, 87% uh, of, I'm sorry, about 92% of heart failure patients being admitted. And this contrasts to data I'll show you that says that 40% of these patients can safely be sent home. And there's the rule I'm going to spend most time on is a rule of Lee et al. that, that teaches about the 40% number. 
And the lowest two quintiles of risk scores have a 0.3% risk of seven-day mortality. And I would argue that seven-day mortality is the mortality we care about, not 30-day or 90-day or one year. And so this Lee rule, which I'll get into as I get into the talk more, suggests we could send 40% of patients home. How can we make that happen when we we're discharging only 7%? Um, well, we got to get past some problems in physician decision making. Clearly, that graph that showed that some doctors admitted 66% of heart failure patients, others admitted 100, everybody else was in between. And these are doctors that admitted 30 or more heart failure patients over a two year period. Showed that there's a lot of variable decision making that gets done. And so there's a lot of clinical reckoning. And reckoning is bad because reckoning is always fallible. And it's fallible both directions. We can fail to recognize a patient who's really sick who ought to be admitted, and they could, and they could conceivably die. Or we could use resources inappropriately and admit someone that doesn't need to be admitted and, and uh, run up our heart failure admission rate needlessly. And there's other factors in the emergency department that make it harder to decrease interphysician variability and make consistent decisions. We're known as the, we, we have more interruptions than any other department in the hospital, and we arguably have higher decision density than any other department. And those are threats to consistent care and structured care. And when there's threats to consistency of care, clinical decision rules help us. So we know some clinical decision rules, some of which we use frequently and some of which we don't. The Ottawa ankle and knee rule, we know them. We probably don't use them because it'd take too long to make the patients accept them. But they could standardize processes for ankle and knee injuries. And we definitely use the Wells criteria to standardize our approaches to patients with possible DVT and PE. And we often use Nexus rules or Canadian C-spine rules regarding C-spine films. So we're familiar as a group with decision rules, and we know they can decrease practice variability. And also, we can improve heart failure care by improving patient throughput. That's totally in our control. And how many of you have a hospital where you do a code heart failure, like code STEMI, where you meet the patient with afterload reduction, heart rate control to, de to decrease myocardial VO2, and diuresis to get rid of the fluid burden? How many people have a code, stem a code heart failure when the patient hits the door? Uh, one, one does. And that's, so you're a, you're a very forward-looking hospital. We're piloting it. You're piloting it. But the, the question is, I, I think it's an, un, an, un, an unrealized opportunity to improve the throughput for heart failure patients. And we'll see how it goes. And then, of course, we can improve. We may be able to improve throughput. We can also work on destination. So there are two rules for heart failure disposition I'm going to go through. And they're going to fill a gap because no national cardiology organization or emergency physician group has actually reached consensus consensus on a standard definition for what constitutes best care for heart failure. So um, the first rule I want to talk about is one that is, is from the United States and the second one's from Canada. But either way, a rule will be a would be a clinical decision support to decrease interphysician practice variability and decrease 30-day readmission for the heart failure patients. And so again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time about throughput, but I want to drop the idea in your head that part of the emergency processes we can control for heart failure patients might be improved throughput as well as improved destination. So improved throughput, again, the idea is code, code heart failure, loop diuretic for fluid overload, manage preload with nitrates, manage afterload with antihypertensives, decrease myocardial VO2 and myocardial work requirement, and potentially help the patient get out of heart failure faster. And again, I, I've asked the question how many have the, that tool and not many people do. But heart failure is arguably a time-critical diagnosis for the patients, especially if they're close to respiratory failure. So in that regard, the heart failure patient is one of our primary customers, just like the patients with the time-critical diagnoses like acute STEMI, acute ischemic stroke, or trauma. And we expedite administrative processes in our ER all the time. We go to bedside registration. We see patients before we actually, we, we actually see patients first then register them later. If we can be empowered to do that, we can be empowered to improve our heart failure care too. So again, t t so I'm, the, the first concept is improving throughput. The second part of the talk is what rules exist to help us make better decisions. So one of them comes from Alan Storrow's group at Vanderbilt, and it's identifying patients who have heart failure who are at low risk for 30-day adverse events, and they divide, devised a clinical decision rule that was validated. It was derived in one set of patients and validated in another, just like any good clinical decision rule, and they looked for adverse events were death, acute coronary syndrome, 
Need for coronary revascularization, need for emergent dialysis, need for intracranial intubation, need for mechanical cardiac support such as a balloon pump, or need for CPR. And I think all of us would agree that this is a pretty useful list of adverse events with heart failure. And the key methods are they had no act, they had no standardized um, specific ED treatment protocol or no active treatment protocol for heart failure patients. They enrolled over a thousand patients in three and a half years, predominantly in hospitals in the Cincinnati and Nashville area. And they documented in that group of patients 126 adverse events. And they wanted to predict who is at risk for adverse events. And some common sense predictors emerged, like the troponin level and the renal function level. And uh, they couldn't detect a, an improvement in the rule if they, if they added in BNP or tachypnea at arrival or need for dialysis. So this rule sort of flies in the face of common sense because some of the things you'd think were important weren't important. And they have an algorithm in the study. They have a, a, a slide. And, and my, my view of my slide shows up better than what projects. But every line in that slide is a variable in the rule. And you simply uh, figure out for each patient how many points they get. So for instance, someone is 58 years old, the, on the age line they get 30 points for that. If they happen to have uh, a BUN of 12, they get 18 points for that. 30 plus 18 is 48. And you take all the elements of the rule, um, age, BUN, sodium level, all the elements, and eventually you get to the bottom of the graph where you can take a total point score and correlate it to a risk of adverse event in the next 30 days. And that's what that red line is showing. It's taking a total point score and correlating it to a risk level. So what you could do in your department is take this figure directly from the reference from Collins et al., which is Storo's group, and you could print copies of it and put it in your department, and you could manually calculate the heart failure risk score and therefore calculate their risk of 30-day adverse event. So why is that useful? That's useful because then you could have an informed decision with the informed clinical decision-making session with your patients, and you could do uh, shared decision-making. So you can tell the patient, based on their score, what their risk of an adverse event is in the next 30 days. And 1% of the patients could be identified as, um, that had one more, 1% one, one uh, if you want I'm sorry, if you want to identify patients that only had 1% risk, there were 0% of the patients at low risk. But if, only, if 3 percent is your risk threshold, then 1.4% were at low risk. And if 5% is an acceptable risk, then 13% were low risk. So I think that, that the nice thing about Collins's rule is it's straightforward because you add up points and come up with a score and it helps you make shared decision making with the patients. But the downside is they don't really talk about risk in the time frame we care about, which is seven days. They haven't operationalized it with the computer and um, they, they really can't send someone home with a, with a high sense of a high degree of safety that me, we might want in our medical legal system in the United States. But they did have a usable algorithm, a clear decision rule, and it's easy to use. You just take the figure from your study, you make larger copies of it, you add up points, you translate points to a risk level, and you have an informed discussion. So that was one rule, but the better rule is by Doug Lee's group up in Toronto. And they predicted heart failure mortality in emergency care in a seven-day time frame. And they looked at 12,000 patients at 86 hospitals all through Ontario, teaching hospitals and community hospitals. And each hospital contributed about 125 patients, rural, urban, teaching, non-teaching, busy, not busy. They excluded reasonable patients like palliative care and DNR patients. And they looked at the outcome of interest that we care about as emergency physicians, death within seven days, not 30. And they did, like all good decision rules, a derivation in one set of patients and a validation in a second set of patients. And they used the statistically valid method of bootstrapping, which is too complex to explain during my talk today, to help fill in missing data points and to, to, to reiterate um, their, their uh, risk percentage estimates the way bootstrapping does. And a really cool thing is they didn't have to have previous heart failure data in the model. You didn't, in other words, you don't have to know the patient's ejection fraction to make this rule work. And that, in my view, that makes this rule more useful. And so here's a way the patients flowed in the study where they had 15,000 potentially eligible patients. They excluded some because they were on dialysis, because they were in palliative care, et cetera. So they had about 12,000 uh, and about 12,600 patients, derived a rule in one set, validated it in another, and they come up with this multiple element rule. And it includes age, EMS transport, systolic blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen saturation, creatinine, potassium. Now you're saying, wait a minute. How can I, in the emergency department, keep a 10-element rule straight? 
this rule is too complex. That doctor at the front of the room is crazy because he's telling us about a rule we can't possibly use because it has too many data elements. Well, you know, if, the, if this rule could be automated, it would be useful. And so there is a rule for computerized decision support. And there actually is actionable intelligence from this rule because de the NNT.com has put this rule on their website and you can just uh, Google the NNT.com and EHMRG, which is the name of the rule, and you can get the, the uh, website to come up and let you just poke in the data manually, and it gives you a score. So the way this rule works is raw data gives a score, a numerical score. Numerical score translates to a quintile of where the patient sits in the risk, ra in the risk grade, and the quintiles translate to a risk of short-term mortality. So you can see in this graph the lowest two quintiles have a 0.3% risk of seven-day mortality. The highest quintile has about an 8.5% risk of seven-day mortality. And this was true in the derivation and the validation set. And you can look at my slides in more detail if you wish to. But the risk for seven-day mortality can be defined as very low in up to 40% of the patients. And that's way more patients than we, than we typically send home with heart failure exacerbations in my shop. And I'll bet that's true in your shop, too. So here's the home page in MDCalc for EHMRG. And again, you poke in the individual data, and it gives you a score. So let's just say you have a 65-year-old with a history of prior to MI, they have a blood pressure 105 over 80, heart rate 95, O2 sat 92%. The one thing that's unclear about the rule, by the way, is whether the O2 sat you use is with or without supplemental O2. And even Lee doesn't, doesn't clarify that because he didn't make sure that the patients were on room air when they were entered in the study. But uh, you, know, the, you have all these details that you know from the patient's history or from their EMS run sheet. And so you go to the website, you poke in the 10 variables, and you end up with a statement for that patient where, um, I'm sorry, the, the, the risk of mortality you see is 8.2% and they have 106 points. So this is a patient that's in the top quintile. This is not a patient you'd send home, which th that sort of follows common sense. But let's, and, and then you put him in the risk grading, he's in the top quintile. This patient gets admitted no matter whether he use a rule or not. But let's look at a different patient, because this, this first patient, no one would send them home. But what about a 75-year-old who's had an MI, and they report some recent dietary noncompliance. Their vitals are pretty reasonable. Their creatinine and potassium are normal. They came in their own vehicle. They don't take metolazone. Poke the numbers in. On the website, his, his, this person's in one of the two lowest quintiles. That sort of defies your expectation because I, at first I think you might have thought I was describing another patient that needs to be admitted. But this rule says the patient's point total is low and they have a 0.3% risk of seven day mortality. So if you've got some cooperation with the cardiologist and there's some way to get the patient follow up in the near term, well before seven days, like maybe a nurse calls the patient to find out how they're doing, maybe you send the patient home with a scale to weigh themselves to keep track of their weight, you know, the, build something in the system for safety, but this patient could be sent home, which I think defies your preconception. And this patient's risk score is in the second quintile, where their, their seven-day risk of mortality is 0.3%. So Lee's model is strong because it puts, it uses, a risk, it uses raw data to give a score, the score gets stratified into a quintile, and the quintile gives a risk of death. And adding ejection fraction did not anything, add anything meaningful to the model. So we don't have to know the patient's ejection fraction to make this rule work, which means we can get this rule filled in from data the patient can usually tell us, and we don't have to go digging in the old chart. And, and then we can send patients home with appropriate discharge, post-discharge care, and we can also prevent high-risk discharges that might have a higher score than you might expect. So again, the limitations, there's 11 variables, one of which is the final fudge factor to make the average score zero, and you have to hand enter the 10, entry, 10 patient data points on nnt.com. And the advantage of the NNT.com, though, is that to build your own clinical decision support at your site would cost about ten dollars to $20,000. So NNT.com did it for us. And it's also cool that the rule doesn't require a BNP level. And so what the, the overall vision going forward is the patient shows up, you have code heart failure to initiate care, eventually you get them and see if they're improved or not, and especially if they look improved, you apply Lee's rule and see whether the patient looks like they could qualify to go home or not. And if you can send 1% more of your heart failure patients home, you can make such a huge difference in, your, difference in your hospital's percentile ranking in terms of heart failure readmissions that you may be able to move your hospital from the penalty zone to the non-penalty zone as regards 
discharge heart failure readmissions. So, uh, let's say one other final point or two. Zero risk is impossible. I can't teach you a risk-free way forward. The lowest risk I can talk about is 0.3%. But if you get patients prompt follow-up, I think you're building a good system for the patients that's in their best interest. And some patients actually would prefer to be admitted rather than being put in the, I mean, prefer to be sent home rather than admitted to hospital. So this is a tool you can build with your cardiologist. And you could also use this to monitor your doctors in terms of their adherence to the rule. You can give them quarterly reports. And you, for instance, Dr. 1, Dr. A, maybe they had 12 patients that were in risk quintile 1 over a monitoring period and 9 in quintile 2. And you could tell the doctor how many of those patients they admitted and maybe how they compare to their peers. So you can give feedback to your doctors about how well they are adherent to the rule and how well your department's doing to help your department move the hospital out of the penalty zone. And so this is a big paradigm shift I'm proposing. Typically we're used to thinking of the hospital as the place where we initiate efforts to decrease the chances of a patient being readmitted with heart failure exacerbations. But I'm proposing that the emergency department also has a lot to add. And with Lee's clinical decision rule, we can discriminate some patients that we may not otherwise send home, that we can actually send home safely, maybe possibly contrary to possible suppositions. And so what this does, it helps us give the right care to the right patient at the right time, and it gets us past the previous problem of no validated clinical decision rule. So we have actionable intelligence for emergency physicians in a highly usable format to give the right care to the right patient at the right time. And again, so at the end of the day, what this does is this facilitates evidence-based medicine and facilitates knowledge translation to take the evidence that Lee is giving us and help us make better application of the decision rule to our patients so we can have more sensible outcomes. So a take-home, Medicare diagnosis that can lead to penalty include heart failure, practice variability regarding heart failure care is an opportunity for improvement. There's a lot of practice variability in most doctor groups for heart failure care in terms of who gets admitted. There's a validated clinical decision rule from the cardiology literature that most emergency physicians have no awareness of. There's a way to use this rule to decrease your hospital's risk of Medicare penalties. And contrary to your initial supposition, this clinical decision rule strongly suggests that we could send more patients home safely despite heart failure exacerbations. So Lee's rule takes data from the patient with the MD calc tool to derive a score to derive a quintile rank, and the quintile rank tells us risks of death. This is a good rule because it's been derived in one set of patients and validated in another, and it doesn't require data you may not have available in the emergency department, and the one thing this rule doesn't do is build that outpatient support that you want to send, so when you send the patient home, you're not sending him off the edge of the cliff, but you're sending him home where you know they're going to get some sort of phone or nurse practitioner follow-up in the next three or four days, just to ensure the safety of the system. So I hope I've taught you something that, of which you are unaware something new, and something you might be able to put to use in your department. And I would welcome any question. I thank you for your attention.